Good afternoon, church family. Thank you, Megan, for the reading of the word. Um, so as you all are watching this, uh, it, we, we are in the process of uh, probably going to the airport, maybe saying our goodbyes from uh, our denominational uh, Grace Community International celebration uh, that we just had uh, this past week. And it just ended at around noon today. Um, so the theme for our international celebration this year is remember our first love, remember our first love. So uh, thinking about this theme, I was reminded of a sermon that I did last year titled Our First Love. So I'll be using the notes from that today. What comes to your mind when you think of your first love? Our first love. Maybe we think of a high school sweetheart for some, maybe our first love for a specific food. Maybe for some, it co it's, maybe it's coffee. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a pet. Um, uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's your spouse, uh, your child, uh, niece, nephew. Maybe it's a favorite place or a hobby. What if I told you that you are God's first love? You are, God, you are God's first love. And God is also your first love. And I'm not just talking about romantic feelings. I'm talking about a supernatural bond that ties God and the human spirit together for eternity. Because God wants nothing more than to be with you forever and for you to be with him forever. Father, Son, Spirit. Many of us um, might seek God only for what God can give us instead of just his presence, we probably, sometimes we, our prayers are just, God, I, I, I want this from you. Um, and even though God d does delight in blessing his children with, with good things, um, he's also, I believe, God can be grieved that even his bless and when his blessings become idols in our hearts, where we seek his blessings more than we seek him. <laughs> um, so it was an idol. Anything can be an idol if it distracts us from God as our first love. But when God is the ultimate desire of our hearts, when we truly worship God and put him first, we find that God, the giver of all good things, is infinitely greater and so much more and better than anything that he can give us. Um, Worship. I, I just mentioned worshiping God and putting Him first. Um, though it's often the word is worship is often associated with religion. Worship isn't just something that religious people do or people who go to church or have a specific faith. Worshiping is something that every human being does. Worship is woven into the very fabric of our spiritual human DNA. For human beings, we were made for worship. And I'll refer to what um, Adele Calhoun says in her book, Spiritual Disciplines Handbook. She defines worship as, worship reveals the somethings or someones we value the most. What we love and adore and focus on forms us into the people we become. Many of us are devoted to the same things that our culture worships. For example, our culture or society worships money, um, yeah. Society's definition of success, whether it's getting getting a house, retirement plans, vacations, you know, physical comforts, those are some of the things that our culture worships. In and of themselves, these things are not bad. These things are very useful. But when we value these things more than we value God, we end up worshiping secondary things. And secondary things can never satisfy our core longings. Only a love relationship with our creator can do that. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we know that we love because he first loved us, as John says in 1 John 4, 19. And in the Old Testament, we know that we must love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength in Deuteronomy 6, 5. And what's most important to recognize is that loving God is not it doesn't just come naturally <laughs> to us. It's not passive or automatic. Loving God, worshiping him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, this is intentional. 
This is a spiritual practice, and practice means loving God, worshiping him, is a conscious, active, daily choice. Just like in our marriages and the most intimate relationships in our lives, we will naturally drift towards isolation and independence if we are not intentional about working, moving towards oneness with one another. And that's the same thing in our relationship with God. And we can do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. So all right, my, the, take, the message, the purpose of my message today is may we put our first love first again. God is our first love. May we put him first again. So let's go to John 12, verses uh, 1 to 2 in the uh, New International Version. John 12, verses 1 to 2. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. He is, uh, Bethany is fairly close to Bethlehem, uh, what's it? Jerusalem. He's heading towards Jerusalem, heading intentionally towards his coming death, which is why he, he came. So this is six days before that, before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, his friend, lived, whom Jesus had just raised from the dead. He raised, so refer to John chapter 11 to read about this amazing story about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, John 12, verse 2, here a dinner was given in Jesus's honor, and Martha, one of Lazarus's sisters, served uh, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Um, uh, do we have the picture of uh, modern day Bethany? I had emailed. Yes. Okay. Yes, we have. So I uh, show a picture. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is a picture of modern day Bethany. It is less than two miles from Jerusalem. Um, it reaches the Mount of Olives, and this is actually like the you know, the, the place where Jesus ascended to heaven. Um, today, Bethany is still a small town of about 1,000 people, and, and the traditional tomb of Lazarus is still marked here in modern-day Bethany. So, again, we know from the previous chapter in chapter John 11, uh, John chapter 11, that Jesus recently uh, raised Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother. He raised him from the dead, and the raising of Lazarus serves as a preview for Jesus' own resurrection. Um, in John 11, we find the shortest verse in the Bible, the famous, Jesus wept. Two words, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep, even though he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead? Well, I believe Jesus weeps because he knows that everyone he loves will inevitably die. And that's not how he, God intended his world to end up. He weeps and he is angry. He's angry that this perfect world that he created, the perfect world that we see in Genesis chapter 1, and the precious humans that he made in his own image, they've been tainted by sin and death. They've been abused by sin and death that was never intended to be in, that, in the picture. Um, and so this episode also prompts the Jewish religious leaders to act against Jesus because of this miraculous raising of, of Lazarus. At the end of John 11, we see the Pharisees plotting to kill Jesus. Um, his miracles, his teaching, and his character made no difference to the high priests of the Sanhedrin. The religious leaders continue in their unbelief because they made their own political survival uh, idols. They, they didn't put, they thought they were putting God first, but really they, they, cared, they cared more about their own status. Their own political survival uh, mattered most to them. So because of this opposition, Jesus wouldn't have wanted to stay in any one place too long. So he withdraws for a short time to this region of Bethany uh, near the desert where he stays with his disciples. So six days before the Passover, Jesus and his disciples return to Bethany, and here a dinner is given in Jesus' honor. Let's turn to um, uh, verse 3 of John 12. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, or in other words, spiked nard, 
an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So if we could show a picture of Spike Nard. Um, this is what Spike Nard looks like. It's also called uh, Nardine or Muskroot or Nard. And this is a class of aromatic amber-colored col essential oil. Essential oil derived from a fl flowering plant in the honeysuckle family, which grows in the Himalayas of Nepal, China, and India. This oil has been used over centuries as a perfume, traditional medicine, or in religious ceremonies across a wide territory from um, India to Europe. And this is, this is probably be uh, when Mary brought this spike nard to pour on Jesus' feet. She probably had it in a beautiful alabaster jar, which is... Uh, the next picture. This might have been what, what it looked like. So some early bur burial ceremonies included perfume being poured over the body to cover the smell of decay or disease. And this was typically used after a person died. But in today's story, Jesus was anointed with perfume prior to dying. This is before his death. Uh, maybe uh, Mary heard of Jesus predicting, ooh, sorry, predicting his death. I'm getting too passionate here. <laughs> uh, maybe Mary heard of, of, of Jesus predict, predicting his death. He was, he was already saying multiple times that he was going to Jerusalem to die. Um, so she, and she knew that she wouldn't be with Jesus much longer. Um, um, but at the same time, if she knew that the perfume was for his burial, she wouldn't have she would have waited until the day of his burial. So we don't really know what, uh, what exactly Mary knew um, as she planned to commit this act of worship for Jesus. But we do know that at least one of the reasons Mary uh, does this is because she adores Jesus. She loves Jesus. Jesus is her, she's acting as though Jesus is her first love. And also, Jesus just raised her brother from the dead. So that's all probably it. And maybe they're really good friends, went through a lot together. So Mary, we see Mary here placing her first love first. Again, her act of worship comes from the depth of her soul, her devotion and love for Jesus. Even though it was irrational, we, we, we read in verse 5 that this costs um, a, a whole year's wages. And also what Mary did was probably an unprecedented thing to be done to a rabbi, um, just very over the top, especially from a woman in that time and culture. But this reflects the kind of gift, this extravagance reflects the kind of gift that Jesus gives to us. His giving, his very life to us was even more extravagant than what Mary did for him. So let's read um, verses 4 to 6 of John 12. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray Jesus, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Judas Iscariot did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he's, he's a treasurer. He used to actually help himself to what was put into the money bag. Oof. So John wants us, John, who's Apostle John who wrote, was writing this, John wants us to know that the perfume that Mary used to worship Jesus was not to be taken lightly. This is a huge, like, ridiculous thing. Like, why are you even doing this? You're crazy. This is a worth a year's, a year's wages. Even what we make today, what we make in a year is, is very, 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 very significant. Um, so a common reaction to this deeply intimate, over-the-top act of worship is like, why is this so wasteful? Why are you doing that? Well, you're crazy. Why is this so extravagant? Ugh. But what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? Verse, verses 7 and 8. Leave her alone. Leave her alone, Jesus replies. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
maybe Mary and Martha and Lazarus and their family, maybe they were poor. But she still did this. Maybe maybe they themselves were poor. Um, but he's saying, you will not always have me physically here with you. So Jesus saves Mary from the criticism of the disciples, and he graciously accepts and even publicly commends this act, this extravagant act of worship. Because what she did wasn't just just good. It was the best that she could give to her Lord at this given time. So Mary's extravagant act of worship, whether she knew it or not, was really for Jesus' anointing for burial. And this is reminding the disciples more and more that death is where Jesus uh, was headed, and that was soon. Jesus explains that we will always have opportunities to assist the poor, but the greater need, at least at this specific moment, was to to anoint him, to worship him with this extravagant, with this perfume. Uh, What Mary did was an extremely intimate act. She is actually transgressing several cultural boundaries here, some big cultural no-nos at the time. Um, An unmarried woman was not to even touch a man, never a rabbi teacher like Jesus, and especially letting her hair down in the presence of men was strictly forbidden. So this is an intimate moment as an utter act of openness, just like complete abandon in worship. Do we have this kind of abandon, this this devotion, this adoration, this worship for our Lord and King Jesus? Mary's response of total abandon and trust is how we are to respond with our lives. Maybe it's not necessarily, I'm not saying to give your whole year's wages away, but it's like asking, asking these questions to God and to ourselves, Lord, am I placing you as my first love? Because it's going to go, it's going to look, our act of worship will look different for every person. But I believe it, this story is also causing me to ask myself and to ask God, um, how am I putting you, Lord, as my first love, first again? Let's continue in um, verses 9 to 11. Uh, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So they not only, the religious leaders, um, Religious Jews do not only want to kill Jesus, they also want to kill Lazarus. So it's just kind of funny. It's like ironic. He literally, Lazarus just died, and he was just raised from the dead. He probably did not want to be raised from the dead. (laughs) And now he's being sought to be killed because he's like the greatest evidence of Jesus' miracles and power and authority over everything. Um, So the Pharisees still plot to kill Jesus and even Lazarus. But what what the Pharisees don't realize is that the Holy Spirit is so intimately woven and active in, in in this, even in their wanting, in their murderous thoughts, the Holy Spirit is still working through their schemes to pave the way for God's plan, for God's redemption um, to to come through. Jesus would be the only person to die on behalf of Israel, on behalf of the world. Um, But this, it would not just be under Rome's wrath. It would be under God's just, righteous anger against sin and death to to vanquish that forever. So not only would Jesus die for the people of Israel, he would die for all people. Jesus' coming death is not a victory for the religious elite hoping to keep the status quo. Instead, the death of Jesus is actually his enthronement. It's his way of being king. His enthronement over all powers, even death. And um, as I close, I would like to refer to, um, at this time, I 
I, I, I had just finished reading um, an excerpt from uh, Lee Strobel's uh, book, The Case for Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel was a former atheist and investigative journalist. And after re reaching his monumental verdict about uh, the resurrection of Jesus, uh, Lee Strobel stated these obvious implications regarding the resurrection of Christ in his book. Excuse me. Uh, Strobel states, if Jesus overcame the grave, he is still alive and available for me to personally encounter. If Jesus conquered death, he can open the door for eternal life for me too. If he has divine power, he has the natural, supernatural ability to guide and transform me as I follow him. As my creator, who has my best interests at heart, Jesus rightfully deserves my allegiance and my worship. God right, rightfully deserves our allegiance, our worship as our first love. In worship, we fall into the arms of God in complete surrender and say, have your way with me, have your way in me. And so one of the ways that Christians worship God is through the spiritual act uh, practice of Holy Communion. So we'll take this time to gather your elements, your bread or cracker, bre um, wine or juice, Thanks. The Lord's Supper celebrates God's redemptive plan through the sacrificial death of Jesus. It's a simple meal of bread and juice where we join ourselves to Christ, our very source of life, and we feed on him in our hearts through faith. Jesus dies for us, for our good, on behalf of us, in place of us, allowing us to live forever in goodness and joy and peace through his death, the death that overcomes death itself, and he reunites us with God, bringing us from separation to communion. So may we partake of the body and, and the blood of Jesus broken and shed for our reunion with God. Let us pray. Blessed be you, O God, who raised to life our Lord Jesus Christ. For you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before you in love. Holy Spirit, have your way in us as we seek to choose you in your ways and place you as our first love first again. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>